Hi everyone, welcome to the big data tutorial. This is Chiu Shi from Arizona State University. First of all, I hope everyone stay home, stay safe, and stay healthy in this uh, coronavirus period. Well, today we are honored to have Professor Zhou from Stony Brook University to give us a talk on the topic of a learning to inform method for real-time power system monitoring, where he will provide a very interesting inference framework to identify the voltage and to estimate the voltage stability margin. So this talk will be around 75 min minutes. And uh, during the talk, please feel free to send me any questions you have through the chat box. And uh, now I will give the speaker to Professor Wong, who will provide a brief introduction for Professor Zhou. Yes, this is Yang from Arizona State. It's my pleasure to have um, Professor Zhao over here. Yeah, I remember yeah, when I was at Stanford University, I learned the great yeah, story how Professor Zhao was tackling the outages yeah, from one location to the other. So he definitely is a leader in such a field if you are following the work. Yeah, on the other side, today's talk is extremely interesting. Yeah, as an educator in Arizona State, yeah, many students here apply machine learning to one application. They try the tour and see whether the tour can improve their performance. However, typically yeah, in learning, you need to understand your data set better so that you can utilize the learning tool yeah, in a later case. So this is exactly what I feel yeah, Professor Zhao will talk about today. So you first try to infer what are the knowledge in your data set, and then maybe that will make your yeah, machine learning model to be more applicable. So Professor Zhao, I'm looking forward to your talk. Yeah, please. Well, thank you, Yang. Thank you, Chiu Shi, for the introduction. And uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And yes, as, as Chiu Shi said, uh, everybody, I hope everybody uh, is well and uh, uh, stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, actually, when I first learned that I will, I, uh, I will be giving this tutorial in this uh, series, uh, the situation wasn't that bad. Uh, but now, I think the the webinar becomes the only way for us to give talks, so which makes me appreciate this opportunity even more. All right, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this uh, learning to infer method for real time power system monitoring. And this is, uh, of course, joint work with many people uh, who are listed here. And uh, also, uh, uh, most of the materials uh, are actually summarized in the forthcoming book chapter. Uh, that is written by me and Professor Boston uh, Zhang. Uh, it's about deep learning in power systems. And uh, so, so the general framework is actually laid out in that chapter. And uh, the two applications that I'm going to talk about today, uh, it's more, more, more details you can also can be found in either the papers and the, or the book chapter. Uh, so uh, we initially coined this term of learning to infer back in 2016. And that is when we develop a method for uh, outage detection problems, uh, which we found very difficult, especially if you look at multiple outages. Uh, but I, I really, I want to know that and see then there are a lot more work, uh, rapidly increasing amount of interesting works that appear uh, have a, a similar spirit to this. So uh, definitely we're doing part of the work, but, but uh, so which I will talk about uh, to some extent, but there are a lot more work, uh, which I will also mention uh, some of them uh, at the end of the lecture as well. Okay. So I want to begin with some motivating questions uh, in a bigger picture. So uh, before talking about this uh, more specific topic, so we all know that deep learning has seen tremendous recent successes in many areas of uh, artificial intelligence. And it has sparked great interest, uh, very rightfully, in this potential use in power systems. And many people are doing uh, problems uh, in this topic, uh, especially recently. Um, for example, Professor, Professor uh, Yang Wang is an expert in these two. So, uh, so 
potential application involves operations we can brainstorm a lot. For example, forecasting seems to be a natural application. And monitoring is a fundamentally a different problem where I think uh, machine learning also play a very natural role. Uh, but moreover, one can think of what about using machine learning to solve optimization problems, like the classically uh, very difficult problems such as uh, OPF, optimum power flow, or uh, you know, security constraint OPF, or uh, really commitment even. Right? And, and moreover, it's also a not that far stretch to think that deep learning can be used for control of our systems. Actually, uh, I think knowledge control uh, people are already having works in using learning method to do um, uh, various kind of control. So it, these are all very natural uh, applications. And uh, so, but if we think about, so uh, the, the excitement is there, the opportunity seems clear, but what are some of the issues with using deep learning in power systems? So I want to emphasize, uh, yeah, emphasize two aspects, uh, sort of give a characterization of the, of, the, of the problems. One is we need to ask ourselves, is the problem that we are trying to deal with predictable or not, right? the fundamental predictability? And uh, this is regardless of complexity of the, of the problem. So for example, uh, we know that deep learning has, seen, uh, has been very successful in highly predictable situations. For example, uh, image classification, uh, speech recognition, et cetera. So in those cases, even though the problem is extremely complex, uh, <clears throat> however, there, the predictability is actually very high. So for example, if you, if you give a cat picture with, versus a dog picture, it's actually quite complicated to train a machine to classify both, but fundamentally no, it's, it's actually it's, it's classifiable. Uh, if you just give it to a human, it, it can easily distinguish a cat from a dog. So that's the predictability. Um, but it is much more challenging to apply deep learning for fundamentally unpredictable situations. I would say the a typical example is a, is the stock market. Right? So if, let's say if we want to forecast the stock market in the future, is uh, it's just fundamentally unpredictable, no matter how sophisticated you are in deep learning. Right. And uh, so forecasting, uh, also, I, I would say the same thinking applies to forecasting. Uh, so we, we really should think about uh, these issues. For example, if we want to predict accurately at 3.01 p.m., what is the wind speed at certain location seven days from today? I would say there's almost no way for you to do it accurately, no matter how sophisticated you are. Right, so this is the predictability issue. So I would say to address this issue, uh, we need to ask ourselves, uh, do we have available uh, input information and signals that are uh, significantly informative? Right? So that's, that's a key question to ask. Now, suppose, even though suppose we have uh, good predictability, we could face a problem that is highly complex, just like the image classification problem. And as I said, it appears to be very powerful in, so, in solving some problems of, of a much higher complexity than before. Uh, other examples like playing games, uh, the off goal example, where you can, where actually you know the, the goal uh, game itself is deterministic. There is no uncertainty, right? Uh, so even though there are two players playing it, but you can use deep learning both learning between very good policy to play games well. A similar question can be asked for monitoring, optimization, and control problems, especially in power systems. And uh, I think the, the key question we, ask, we should ask ourselves is, uh, suppose we have very good computation power, then we really need to ask ourselves whether we have available data and uh, probably do we have labels. We have enough labels for us to unleash the power of uh, deep learning. Right. So. Uh, in particular, in this talk, we're going to focus on monitoring. So uh, the motiv uh, beyond motivation, um, so real-time power system monitoring, we know that power systems efficient, reliable, reliable and secure operation is crucially dependent on effective monitoring of the system. And the real-time information on the current grid status 
is not only key for optimizing resources to economically maintain normal space operation, but also crucial for identifying potential, potential problems that may lead to blackouts. So it's very important for security and reliability as well. And we also know that with increasing penetration of renewables and electric vehicles and other DRs, our system comes even more dynamic. Therefore, it's even more crucial to have faster power system monitoring that offers more accurate and actionable information in real time. So I think uh, we have very strong motivation for this problem. And uh, this tutorial in particular is going to focus on steady state monitoring. And for a good tutorial on transient, I would point to uh, no other than one of the recent previous tutorials that I also watched, which is very interesting on, on the dynamic security assessment. But we're going to focus on steady state. All right. So general formulation of steady state power system monitoring can be uh, modeled like this. So we have a observation model. So Y is the observation, the measurements. And H is a measurement function or observation function. It's the noiseless measurement before we add noise. So it's a joint function of a lot of things of complex nodal complex voltages that we typically call the state of the system. And component statuses, we use S to denote component statuses like whether some line is on or off. And alpha is uh, just the parameters, the line parameters, for example. And H is this highly not, not, uh, complicated function that, that maps all kinds, all these quantities into the position of the sensors. And uh, it's driven by the AC power flow model, obviously. And, uh, and then we add noise in the end. So this, so this is a general observation model. And typically uh, in monitoring, whatever task you are trying to do, we can uh, model your objective as a desired function with which we call F here. So F is a function of everything. So this is really the desired function that you want to compute. For example, uh, for situational awareness, uh, one classic example is state estimation. So uh, the F is just the, uh, X itself, the state. You just want to compute the state. For altitude detection, you, you will want to compute the component status vector S. So S is equal to S. And two more examples. One is prevent, uh, for a preventive analysis. So one is voltage stability analysis. Then uh, uh, you may say S, this uh, desired function you want to compute is the voltage stability margin. And for community analysis, this S can be uh, a binary indicator of whether the system is the minus k secure or not. That's just one example. So uh, say in, in the end, all we want to do is to compute whatever we desire to compute based on whatever we can observe, which is why. And this is uh, intrinsically an inference problem. Right? So we want to infer some value f based on the observation y. Okay. So now I want to bring in, uh, you know, the, the uh, school of thoughts of addressing this problem. And well, naturally there are two uh, types of approaches, data-driven and uh, model-driven. And from this comparison, I want to emphasize the role of the physical model in the power system and why that is super important. So if you think about doing a data-driven method, then there's Obviously, some limitations. I mentioned before, uh, we, we, we should ask ourselves, do we have enough data and do we have enough labels, right? So it turns out that uh, it could happen that we, if we just want to focus, uh, want to impl employ a data-driven method, uh, we often end up in a situation where we don't have sufficient real-world data, or even if we have a lot of data, it's very poorly labeled, or the label is not really corresponding to what we want. Uh, stuff like that. Or when we deal with uh, rare events, uh, we simply don't have uh, enough rare, rare events observed in the historical data. 
right? So these are some limitations. And, and rightfully, historically, model-driven methods have been mainstream in power systems. And this is because information embedded in the physical model is absolutely crucial. Right? So uh, for, for example, for state estimation, even with just one shot measurement, we can already perform state estimation because we know AC power flow model. However, uh, challenges do arise for model-driven approaches in providing effective solutions, especially in fundamentally hard problems. Uh, those problems, like if you, if you want to do AC state estimation, it becomes nonlinear and it's uh, less trivial. And also for combinatorial problems where uh, the, the, the complexity is uh, exponentials, then even if you know the physical model, it's, it's still very, very uh, computationally hard to solve such problems, right? So uh, I'll, give, I'll give some examples of the physical model-based inference. For example, for state estimation here, we're trying to estimate the state X and uh, you observe the observation Y and H is the observation function that uh, represents uh, noiseless uh, observations. And you can solve this, uh, in general, nonlinear least square problem. And that will give you the state estimation result. And then uh, you can also ask, what about, uh, I want to do joint auto-rejection and state estimation. Well, then, then the model, the formula will be, you want to minimize over everything that you don't know about. For example, the state and component synthesis, you want to uh, still do this uh, nonlinear least square problem. But this is very hard. And then, for example, volatility stability margin estimation, uh, you want to know, given that your current operating point is stable, uh, you want to know what is the minimum perturbation that will already lead your operating point to, a, uh, to, to instability, right? So that's a, the worst case uh, disturbance, in a sense. And accuracy develop, for example, we can, one way, uh, which is often used, is to compute the smallest eigenvalue of the Jacobian from solving power flow equations. And this is because uh, it's, just, it's right at the boundary of the stability region, uh, we do have that uh, the Jacobian becomes singular. So the smallest eigenvalue kind of indicate how close we are to instability. And uh, also we can try to check the mass scale security in general. So that is the the system can continue to operate and uh, every combination of key component outages of interest uh, by assuming every outage, every contingency, uh, resolving the powerful equations or resolving the OPF if we are talking about corrective conditions analysis. So these kind of problems. Uh, and again, the limitations are really the computation complexity in real time because none of these are trivial problems. It, they require a lot of uh, model-based computation, and in particular, if the problem is not convex, it becomes harder. If it's combinatorial, again, it's fundamentally hard because we just cannot search everything. Okay, so uh, we want to, of course, uh, you know, it comes naturally that we want to have the best of the both worlds. Can we leverage data-driven approach and model-driven approaches? Uh, it's for a very good reason because we know data driven projects have limitations, especially in terms of the amount of data labels. But we also know that we shouldn't just ignore power system uh, physical model because uh, power system is an engineering system and has very clearly understood physical models. For example, the AC power flow model. And the qualities that we measure in the power system all follow these physical laws. So we somehow, some way, should exploit such information. Um, because these information are absolutely crucial. So a question will be, how do we maximally incorporate the information in the physical model in a data-driven approach? So let's, so that's uh, where we want to go. Uh, that is a machine learning-based monitoring that somehow exploited information in the physical model. So let's start general. So, uh, we begin with a gener generative model. P is the probability, it's the drum probability, it's uh, 
can be mixed uh, continuous and discrete. So as remember it's the state, S is the component statuses, Y is the observations. And because we uh, are dealing, uh, we are focusing on steady state, so I assume the parameters are steady by two of the parameters. And here the drawing probability can be factored into these uh, P of X S and P of Y given X S. I want you to focus on the second part. Let's see if I can use the pen. Yeah. So this part is, is the physical model, basically, is given the state, given the component statuses are uh, the, the Y, the observation, the noiseless observation is actually deterministically determined by this and the physical model. And probably it's basically the adding on top of that uh, noises. Right. So this is a this is a generative model to generate all the quantities in the system, including the observations. So we want to do inference based on just the observations. Why? And uh, so what we on the high level what we want to do is to find a predictor function f of y, which given inputs, which is our observations y, is going to output values that are closest to what we want, which is this so-called desired function that talk about whatever that is given your specific task and objective. So you just want this kind of magic predictor function f that maps y to some number that is very close to what you want, which is f. And you can formulate this problem as the following problem, which is you minimize over this predictor function, this function optimization at this point where you want to minimize some expected loss. Uh, the loss is loss between, uh, basically it's, it's, yeah, it's the loss uh, of uh, the ground truth being F, little f, whereas your uh, predictor gives capital F. Uh, you, you take expectation over uh, all the randomness in the system. And so that's the general problem that I want to deal with. Uh, if, 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 if we want to use, uh, Machine learning based approaches to uh, produce a predictor. And uh, there's this concept called the target function. The target function is the best ever you can do, assuming you, you have no constraints on the, the, the uh, no constraint whatsoever on this predictor. You can choose anything you like. And what is the absolute best predictor you can come up with? And we call it the target function S star of Y. And so this is a true minimum, uh, a minimizer of the above uh, optimization problem. And actually uh, it's not that unfamiliar to you, I suppose, because one example is if the law function you, so you choose is the square error of the ground truth and the predicted, then the target function is nothing but the conditional expectation. So that is uh, that is probably the best. So however, in general, this target function is, uh, is, is conceptually useful, but is practically a nightmare to compute. It is often computationally intractable, not only to evaluate or even just to express what is this target function, it, it can be very difficult. But at least it gives us a conceptual framework. Uh, it gives us an ideal target to shoot for. Okay. So we would like to find a predictor function fy, which is close to the target function, right? So that it, it matches the target function as close to as possible. And fy takes the form that allows fast evaluation of its values. So basically, if you give me a y, I can very easily compute what is this f of y. Uh, so usually f of y cannot be anything. We have to put it in the parameterized family of functions. So the parameterized by some parameter beta, right? So then uh, the problem becomes, oh, okay. So it can be a very complicated fam family of functions though. But can we find the optimal parameter in this family of functions that minimize the loss, expected loss? And this is still very difficult though. Uh, for a number of reasons. For example, it can be a very difficult optimization problem. Second, you know, the, 
uh, exploitation can be very messy. And uh, so what kind of laws do you choose is also may not, may not be even, yeah, it may not be even uh, differentiable like that. So it's, 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 it's still only on a conceptual level and it's, it's very difficult to uh, evaluate still. Now, what do we do? So the key step four is to realize the following is that this expectation can be approximated asymptotically uh, closely, uh, you know, asymptotically as more as more numerical samples you draw, it becomes more accurate by a empirical mean. So the empirical mean is given by if you can draw numerical samples from the trend, from the generative model, right? and then uh, you you draw as many samples as you like, and you can try to minimize this empirical mean. And that will approximately give you the optimal uh, function that you're looking for, right? So this is nothing but a empirical risk minimization problem then. So in the end, what you do is you train a discriminative model with multiple samples from a generated from a generative model, right? And if you can do that, then uh, you can apply as complicated a uh, predictive model as you, as you like, right? So you can, you can make this uh, predictive model very complicated and you can generate many, many data to train this model so that it's uh, asymptotically optimal, right? So th the thing is, in our system, we do have a physical model that we can, we can generate labels. So that is essentially how we can utilize the physical model in this framework to generate samples and then train a predictor in, uh, in, in, in this machine learning framework. And then the training predictor is going to give you a um, closed optimal result. So uh, briefly for the general method, I, I will go into the specific use cases where um, very understandably in each specific use case, it has its own special changes. And we need to deal with all kinds of challenges. So, uh, so what is this learning to infer method? We, we have two phases of uh, work to do. The majority of the work is offline. We have, we have to do first generate data set using model simulations with power flow and system models. And we need to select a parameterized function class. And then the second, we need to, the second uh, Study the offline computation is to train the function branches with the generated data. And then uh, with a trained model, we can use it in online, and that is literally in real time because we, we, we only need to collect instant measurements from the system and compute the, predict, compute the prediction function. So this is general framework, or we can write in a diagram like this. We have online and offline. So on, uh, the offline computation is uh, based on the simulator. We do simulated data. And the simulator, of course, is using the physical laws. And then we put it in the learner to train the predictor. And once the predictor is trained, the power system is going to, the actual power system is going to give us real time measurements. And we're just going to feed that into the predictor and, and infer the target function that we want to um, evaluate. Okay. So the key advantages of this uh, framework is, uh, first of all, label because we're simulating data based on the model, therefore label data can be generated in a often, you know, it's not, uh, in, in, in many cases, label data can be generated in arbitrary large amount of efficiently because many types of labels are just built in because this, this is you who generate the labels. And because of this, also very complex predictor models can be trained to ensure a good approximation of the target function. And overfitting is much less of an issue because uh, if you found overfitting is happening, all you need to do is to generate some additional data and, and train it with more data. And offline computation, so what is the key? The key is offline computation is maximally exploited for the best real-time inference performance. So in other words, we move the computation as much to offline as possible to prepare us to, to have a better real-time performance. Um, so the, the fundamental idea is the information from the field models, right? 
which is absolutely crucial, is represented by the simulated data. And then in this way, it is indirectly seamlessly integrated with that from real-time sensor measurements. And last but not least, all we are trying to do here is to accelerate the real-time computation and that can further be used to accelerate key procedures in process operations, for example, convenience analysis, security constraint OPF, et cetera. All right, so let's jump into uh, the first case study we want to talk about, which is uh, multi-line auto identification. So what is the motivation here? Motivation is that missing and incorrect information of multi-component failures, not a single failure, but multiple components, is a major cause of large-scale blackouts in power systems. For example, cascading failures can develop very quickly in wide area power networks. Uh, there are quite a few examples, and one of them is uh, the cascading failures in 2011 that also impacted uh, Arizona. Uh, it's caught 7 million people out of power in 11 minutes. Uh, and it's, it's the depth of the failures can be much, much beyond just a man's work. So if you really want to, in a very short period of time, to get accurate situational awareness of what is rapidly developing. Right? So yeah, so system operators need real-time accurate information of complex failure scenarios to effectively contain failures. So what we need to do is do it in real time. So at any time instant, given all available measurements, by how do we infer the current topology and failure scenario, uh, which is represented by this component status vector S. It's a binary vector of all the components. Um, so this on the high level is a one, it's, it's one big hypothesis testing problem, but the problem is, if, you, you have a complexity that grows exponentially with a number of onshore lines data sets. So you have a system of, of, of thousands or tens of thousands or even a larger number of components. And maybe three or four, four of them are simultaneously in outage. There's no way for you to search over all possibilities. So even though hypothesis testing is a general framework, in practice, we have to do something uh, more uh, advanced. So there are uh, many related work. Um, roughly, I categorize them into two here, uh, two types of here. One is a real-time uh, uh, identification of outages using instant measurements. And uh, if you use the search-based method, you, you can search all n minus one, probably, maybe n minus two but very difficult for more. And uh, if you use uh, exposed sparsity, then um, more can be done than exhaustive search. And uh, there are also previous work on using graphical model to model the power systems and then the massive pass algorithm can be developed. So that, so there uh, it can address a different number of voltages simultaneously. And there's also sequential detection developed as well. And then there, there are also a bunch of uh, works that address non-real-time topology identification where uh, you do need to collect it over a certain period of time before you can make the detection decision. Okay. So challenges again, in this case, is the complexity of the problem, the fundamental complexity. It grows exponentially with the number of control lines that it sees. And yet we want to real-time inference of complex failure scenarios. We only use instant measurements, and yet we want to have high accuracy. Right. So now let's test it in the framework of learn to infer uh, that we talk about. So uh, it's, let's start with a probability formulation. The optimal inference of the grid topology post outage, uh, this, this S vector, it depends on the posterior probability, right? The pro posterior probability of this component series vector given the act of vision. All right, but 
know that even listing this posterior probability has an exponential complexity because uh, it, because it's, it's, there are two to the uh, number of uh, components, right? That many of the probabilities we need to list. Now let's let's uh, move one step further. Let's say we focus on marginal inference. That is to compute the marginal probability for each line given the observation. Uh, but it, it actually doesn't. It's 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 uh, superficially address the problem, but it, it doesn't fundamentally address the complexity problem. Uh, one way to understand this is that summing out all the other components exponentially complex procedure. Or you can think about that the map detector, the map in maximum a posterior probability detector, which is the optimal detector. Uh, it actually has for, for every single line, even for this binary detector, has can have a very complicated decision boundary, very non-trivial to, to uh, learn about. So in this learning to infer framework, what is the desired function we want to compute is this uh, posterior probability, right? That's the, that's the desired function we want to compute. And what we want to approximate is by offline training this posterior probability for each line, the functions that can enable real-time online inference. Right? So that's what we want. So, Continuing on this uh, direction, so we, we want to find a variational distribution. Variational means that it's uh, it's not a, a ground truth, but it's it's something that we can handle, but it's also close to the ground truth. The variational distribution Q to approximate P such that the model Q has sufficient expensive power so that when you so that it can closely represent the complicated uh, post the true ground truth posterior probability. And also, given the observation matter y, this variational distribution q can be easily computed, and that's the key. Right? So, first of all, you want it to be close to the ground truth, and at the same time, you want it to be very easy to compute, not requiring uh, exponential computation complexity. And we optimize the variational distribution via empirical risk minimization, as we talked about before. And in this particular case, uh, it's in the form of Minimizing the chaotic divergence of the control probability P and the variational distribution Q beta, beta is parameter. And this can be uh, turned into these maximization problems. Uh, and then uh, again, we, we turn it into a empirical risk minimization problem where you draw Monte Carlo samples from generative model. And here, the labels are indeed built in because when you generate data, um, uh, you, you generate with the knowledge of uh, which lines are simultaneously uh, in outage. So when you, uh, and, and then when you train it, you do know these labels. And that's also, we can just use supervised learning to do it. And that's how uh, it is done. Okay, some neural experiments. And in, in this case, we look at uh, the actually 300 bus. And there are a huge number of candidate topologies that is you know, post outage candidate topologies that we're interested in to infer uh, because we, we don't want to just focus on simple cases where you have one or two outages, uh, but actually we, we look at, if you look at all the outages that we try to, uh, we, 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 we are addressing, the average cardinality is 11.6, so definitely very dense uh, simultaneous outages. And that's why we have a huge number of candidate topologies, which we just cannot exhaustively search all, all, over all of them. And moreover, another thing I want to emphasize is that we we don't want to be uh, uh, just addressing the ideal situation where your power system stays or the projection actually doesn't change. But we want to address the hard problem where your state is actually very variable. Uh, so Basically, in the end, we want a predictor that can work in any scenario, any ulti scenario, as well as any uh, power injections and uh, states. Right? And then we have noisy measurements of all phase angles at all the buses, but we also evaluate for subset of the buses. Okay, so that's the situation that we want to deal with. And we use neural networks uh, with shared features. So, 
what do we mean by shared features? Remember, remember we need to have a binary predictor for every single line, right? So we don't want to train a, a set predictor for every single line and, and that's uh, not efficient. That can be done though, but it's not the best way to do it. Uh, we find out. Rather, we want to, sh we have an intermediate layer that we, which have shared features and then they can just uh, further connect to all the output uh, neurons where each neuron correspond to one, um, uh, predicting one, uh, uh, one particular line, right? So that's the neural network. And uh, in this case, we generate a, a 1.8 million data for training and which are sufficient. And uh, we use 200K testing data and we want to know that it's absolutely different from training. So every, every one of the 200K testing data contains a topology that is not seen in the training data. And of course, also the state, the power injection is also not seen in the, in the, in the, in the previous, uh, in the training data. And, and furthermore, know that our average cardinality is 11.6. So uh, we are randomly generating such all these patterns. So they, they really look very, very differently. If you think about how many data do we generate in total, it's in the training set is 1.8 million. Think about how many possible data we could have generated. It's 10 to the 21. So even we generate a huge amount of data, seemingly, which is 1.8 million, it is still a very tiny fraction of the possible, possible uh, all the possibilities. So, and, and this is actually important to note uh, because uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, uh, we're, we're not going to be sure about the generalizability of the approach. But if we can, only generate a tiny fraction of the other possibilities and yet can generalize to all of the unseen topologies uh, demonstrated by testing data. You know, testing data is also purely randomly generated, completely different from training. And then we are, then we are sure about the generalizability of the method. So, uh, so this is the, tr the, the figure it's the training data says, you can see the best performance we get it's an accuracy of 0 0.1997, which is on average uh, among 11.6 line outages, simultaneous line outages. On average, only one of them is uh, misidentified, which uh, we regard as very high performance. And just a few words on, on the training time is uh, three hours on the GPU. The testing time is very, very uh, <clears throat> little. And because of this, we see great generalizability, right? So again, training data is tiny fraction of all of the previous, uh, all of the possibilities where uh, the testing data is drawn from, right? So uh, we also see as to increase the training data size, size uh, how the performance uh, differ. So depending on how much, actually depending on how much computation you want to spend, if you, if you like, you can just do this maybe uh, because 99% is already good enough then you can train relatively short amount of time and then the predictive model is already uh, sufficiently good in, in some sense. So we want to examine the scalability as well. So here are some numerical experiments. Uh, so the first one is, I don't have the label, but let me write it down. So this is 30 bus, this is 118, this is 300. So this is just trying to show how much data is needed when you train uh, for a predictor for different sides of the network. And uh, it turns out that the amount of data, so showing in this uh, lower right corner, it grows approximately linearly with the problem size. So which is a good thing to note. So in fact, we do have a pretty desirable scalability of the method at least for this particular application. Okay. So generalizability, we want to verify and scalability, we also want to verify. Okay. Uh, this is just to give you uh, a more detailed look of the training procedure. So this is a power flow in the volume bus. So uh, as you, you see the training and testing are very, very close. We actually don't have much of overfitting in this case. 
Okay, so that's one case study where it's kind of a very natural uh, application because we, act, we can generate all the situations, all these patterns where we also know the labels. So the similar threading is very, very handy here. And the second study, as it will turn out, is not as uh, straightforward anymore. It's the one to do the multi stability margin estimation. So the motivation is that, uh, yeah, the voltage class is uh, one of the major causes of large scale black holes. And moreover, increasing penetration of renewables bring higher variabilities into power system operations. So because of that, our system is even more dynamic, as I mentioned before, and the stability is, uh, is, is more challenged. And determining the, uh, the system stability margin, right, in real time, basically how, how not only are we stable or not, but how stable are we? That is, how close are we to instability? Uh, we want to know this in real time. It's very valuable for the system operator, not only to maintain situational awareness, but also uh, we can apply, so at, I'll show you in a later slide, we can apply this to, uh, to, to uh, system operation of optimization to try to keep a safe operating margin. And in particular, we study stability from a static analysis perspective, uh, which uh, has something to do with bifurcation, right? And also, uh, so there's a classic reference there. When bifurcation starts to happen, you don't have stability anymore. And also at the boundary of the stability margin, sorry, the, uh, uh, at the boundary of the stability region, uh, the AC power flows to copy and become singular. And so this is, a kind of an algorithm check of are you are you hitting instability or not? And I want to mention that there are also time-based analysis, not static-based, static analysis, but time-based, time time domain-based uh, analysis of all your stability. Uh, and actually, uh, if you want to look at look at a comprehensive uh, summary. I, I'll point you to this uh, classic paper right, right here. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, for time for time domain uh, problems, uh, one of the previous uh, tutorial is is, uh, is is very good reference. Okay, so what is the problem? So the goal is given an unstable operating point, we want to estimate its distance to voltage instability and we want to do it in real time. So the stability region, uh, the actually conceptually, hmm, actually there's some, uh, okay. yeah, there's some, something not looking good here, but yeah, but it, uh, the, the voltage stability margin, I, I converted from Mac to Windows, but I, I explain. So the voltage stability margin of, uh, sorry, the stability region, C, is all the power profile that do not induce voltage instability. Remember, we're studying static analysis, right? And the stability margin of any power profile is the distance, and for example, Euclidean distance from it to the instability region, which is the complement of the stability region. Right? So for example, in this case here is operating point, I'm drawing the boundary, Inside is stable, outside is in, instable. So the stability margin is this, is this uh, <clears throat> distance. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically, so forget about this. This is uh, somehow messed up. We call it the distance between S and, uh, and the, the complement of, of the stability region. Uh, but it's nothing but trying to find the minimum distance. Right? And in this case, the desired function is. Uh, just this distance. So we want to have a predictor that just output this distance. Right? So, what, but it's, it's highly challenging uh, for a few reasons to compute this uh, stability margin. Th there is really no computationally efficient representation of this, uh, of this boundary or region. Uh, we can numerically try to trace out the boundary but it's very high dimensional. Right? So it's a very high dimensional problem. If you have a 
even if you have a medium-sized power system, it's very hard to measure volume. And it's, it's not convex nor concave. It's, not, it's a general region. So we are kind of uh, really working in the dark in sense. Right? So can we try to have a verb, a region that is hard to characterize in the high dimensional space, and yet for any new point that we're given, we want to instantly output what is its distance to the boundary, right? It, it is uh, very challenging indeed. What is happening? Okay. Yeah, I, it's very weird. Um, so again, it's a problem of uh, converting Mac to Windows, sorry about that. Uh, I will draw it actually. So don't worry about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, stuff in the middle. Uh, it, it's supposed to be a figure, okay? So the classic, the, the foundational method is a continuation power flow. That is uh, when you draw it, when you have a point and you, you want to you, you, uh, specify a search direction, Right, so this is the boundary. You specify a search direction and the continuation power flow is going to search along this direction and it's going to accurately locate when it touches the, stability, the boundary of the stability region, okay? Uh, however, if you want to use, so it, it, it is somewhat computational heavy, but not so much because if you specify direction, uh, you can just follow that iterative method. Uh, but the problem is you need to specify the direction, right? So how do we know which direction is the one that is closest to the boundary, right? So there, there's no magic to tell, tell us which direction is the worst case direction. So that's the that's a, that's a key challenge in um, actually generating uh, labeled data for our training, right? And there is a brilliant work uh, which is this iterative matter, which I suppose to have is I have supposed to have a, a plot that is captured from this paper shown in here, but uh, I will just draw it. So this iterative method does the following. It says, okay, suppose you have a boundary, and suppose you don't, of course, we nobody knows the boundary a priori. We are trying to uh, discover the boundary, right? So you have an operating point. How do you know which direction is the worst direction? And suppose you start with a direction that you think makes sense, let's say this direction. And you run continuation power flow to here, and then you don't, you don't know whether this direction is, uh, is the closest or not, right? But there's a way in this paper that you can compute a scoring hyperplane of the region of this uh, stability region. And then what you can do is you can do a projection onto this supporting hyperplane. And this direction is going to be the next direction to search. And you can see that now here, you have another supporting hyperplane and then you project to this supporting hyperplane and it will converge in this case to a locally optimal direction where at least locally you get the worst case margin. So this is what this paper does, is it, 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 it only addresses the issue of trying to find out the magical direction in a very high dimensional space, which, which looks impossible. But in this, with the iterative method, you can actually um, do it in a much more efficient way. Uh, but of course, it's locally worst case that there are, if, the, if the boundary is more complicated than this nice con concave convex shape, uh, then you're not sure about whether even this method, uh, you're not sure whether you are, you are reaching the minimum distance or not. Then uh, what we do is we just uh, search uh, many directions followed by this series method to, to make sure that we get the right, at least uh, we, we get much more higher confidence of we get the right direction. That is indeed the worst case. So all these methods are, are okay computationally, but still not very fast. 
Um, a faster way, which I mentioned a moment ago, is to just compute. So you don't do any continuation power flow. You just compute the power flow equation, solve it at the current point right here, and then just look at what is your Jacobian and look at the smallest singular value or smallest eigenvalue and say that is the indication of how far away you are from the, 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 the boundary uh, because if the smallest singular value becomes zero, then you are right at the boundary. So it's a good indicator. It can be computed, but uh, it's a heuristic. So the observations that we want to make is uh, that it's going to help us to deal with this problem is the following is the uh, right is the following is that it's actually computationally easy to verify just verify if any operating point is stable or not in other words uh, just obtain a binary label of a operating point like whatever operating point that is inside the stability region here right I just compute the power flow and I can know whether it converges or not. It's a binary label. But of course, if the binary label doesn't tell us the distance to the boundary, uh, but with CPF, it's computationally easy to compute the distance from, from, from the operating point to the boundary along a given direction, right? And, but it is computationally a lot more costly to compute the actual voltage stability margin. And the best we can do is uh, what I mentioned in the last slide, which is a iterative method. Uh, but if you have a more complicated boundary, you need to search again. You need to have many interactions to, to be searched over. Uh, so yeah, because, uh, because if you really want to compute the actual voltage speed margin at the worst case, in principle, you need to search other actions in higher high dimensional space. Okay, so what do we do? So it's the general procedure, let's cast it under the learning to infer framework, is to generate samples based on process model, train the predictor of the split margin based on the generated samples, and then use the offline training predictor for online inference of the margin. So this is a regression problem now, right? The previous uh, audit detection is a classification problem. But now it's a regression problem. But the challenge is the lack of those because compute an accurate approximate solid margin is very computation heavy. You need to do multiple, multiple, actually many multiples of CPF. And even so for a large system, generating a large amount of uh, training data is very, very time consuming. And it can even be infeasible for offline computation. So I want to mention, yeah, I think I have it in the next slide. Right. So, but I want to mention if you compute, if you can, if you uh, measure the computation time to just get the zero one label of a single operating point versus the computation time of to approximately compute the voltage speed margin is at least Two orders, uh, two orders of magnitude different, right, at least. So we want to utilize this uh, particular observation that we just make to improve our learning efficiency. In in, in particular, uh, the, the the fact that we cannot even generate enough labels of uh, the, the true voltage speed margin. So how do we do this? So the observation is, although computing a stability margin is computationally heavy, verifying if an operating point is stable or not is very fast. And that leads to the solution that we're going to introduce, which is a transfer learning solution. And we can generate a much, much larger, a sufficient large data set of data operating points with just the binary label of whether it is stable or not. And let's learn as much as possible from this binary label data set. And then we generate a relatively small data set, much smaller than the previous one, of data points, operating points with 
stability margin labels precisely because computing a stability margin label is at least two orders of magnitude slower than computing a binary label. So we cannot afford to generate a very large data set. And then we try to transfer what we learn from the large scale one label data set to further learning from the much smaller margin label data set. Right? So we kind of the hope is by learning from just the zero one label data set, we learn something that is useful, which gives us the starting point for, for us to fine tune with the stability margin labels. So the overall training structure is like this. So we sample a very large number of uh, operating points with zero one labels. That's offline. That's a large data set. We only sample a small number of operating points with distance, the margin label computed. And offline, we also put two procedure training. So the, gen the data generation is two, it's a, it's a two step procedure. Uh, the training also two step. First step, we just train a classifier. We just train a classifier using a zero one label data set. And that, that classifier does nothing but also, you know, whether a new point is stable or not. It doesn't tell anything about, at least uh, uh, on a superficial level, it doesn't tell you what the margin is. But inherently, it tells us something about the boundary. And we're going to use a small data set label with the margin, employ the intermediate features learned by the classifier to further learn a regressor, a margin label estimator using regression. Right? The first step is classification on a large data set, and then we bring intermediate features to fine tune to, to get a regression result. And online, we just apply the end to end trained estimator, it's a regressor, to any newly observed uh, operating point to estimate its multi-stability margin. And that is done in real time. Okay, so that's overall structure. So the predictor is uh, look like this. We again use neural net. Uh, in this case, it's actually not complicated. It's a three layer for the, for the classification. We have the input layer, the hidden layer, and the upper layer. That's just the classification. And then after we train the intermediate layer, oops, yeah, I mean this layer, I, I will just bring it here. I, I won't even touch it. So I'll just assume that the classification uh, the, the step is going to give us good features for us to further fine tune for regression. And then we're going to fine tune it with a newly trained layer uh, to with the all this ability margin data, in the end, we get a, a regressor that is going to tell us end to end, give me a new operating point, I'll output what is the distance, the, the, the worst case margin, right, to the stability boundary. Okay, so let's look, uh, uh, look at how, good it, uh, how well it works. We, again, we look at actually 300 bus. Uh, so how do we generate the data? We, we, we try to generate as, as random as possible. So we start with the, the base case that provided in the every test case. We vary it to a very significant degree. We multiply each P and Q with ID, ID uh, uniform zero to one. So that gives us very, very uh, a huge amount of variations of directions, uh, right, of the power profiles. So we, we in particular generate 300, uh, sorry, 720K directions. And in total, we generate 1.4 million uh, points. That is uh, for the binary label data set. Okay, so I, yeah, so this is, this is, this is a zero one label data set. Uh, 1.4 million, uh, 720K infeasible and 720K feasible. And we generate this uh, because every for every direction we just search along the CPF using CPF. Uh, when it touches the boundary, we shrink a little and extend a little to get a pair of feasible and infeasible points. And we do that for every randomly generated direction. Okay, and then we generate 11.4k points. So it's, that's like uh, yeah, like un under uh, for smaller data points with a voltage stability margin approximately computed. So how do we do it? For every point, uh, every opening point, we're going to search along every coordinate, 
uh, adequate. So there's a lot of energy to search along because it's higher initial, it's a very high initial phase for a 300 bar system. Uh, so followed by the iterative method in, in, uh, proposed in this uh, in this paper that I mentioned. Uh, and also we do data augmentation. How to do that? So, so this is specified in this figure. Suppose we have for every point, we, we have computed the worst, worst case direction like this, right? Then we know that a lot in on this, this particular line, every point actually I know the worst case direction, right? Uh, because it all points to this boundary that I know. So, so I can, at least on this particular line, I can generate as many uh, new points with a known worst case direction as possible. And that's how we augment further our data. Right. Okay, so let's look at some of the experiments which we found very interesting. So uh, for, for learning the boundary, that is the classification problem, uh, we just report a number here. Not surprisingly, it's very, very good. We use one million sample for training, uh, 400K for testing. The testing classification accuracy is over 99%. And then, okay, that train, we use the intermediate feature to fine tune for margin estimation with uh, transfer learning, right? This is a transfer learning step. We use uh, 10K for training, 1.K for testing. And turns out the testing MSC is very small. So you look at this, uh, what happens? This is the, this is the uh, scatter plot on the, on the right for margin estimation. We're using transfer learning, the predictive margin versus the, the, the upper right corner I'm talking about, the predictive margin versus the true margin. And it's predicting extremely well. It's actually quite surprising to us even. The MSC is very slow, our square is very high, and uh, if you just look at the testing computation time, extremely fast. It's like a few milliseconds because it's just a four pass. It's actually the, the computation time on laptops. Is if you if you have high performance computers, even a shorter time. And the Jacobian turns out to be not working well. Not only that, there's something very interesting that we we observe is if you look at the result of Jacobian. So the, if you look at the smallest singular value of the Jacobian as an indicator of how close you are to the boundary. So we have the lower right corner plot. And uh, it basically says beyond certain point, I will say maybe here, if your margin, if you're not that close to the, to the boundary, then Jacobian basically tells you nothing at all. Right? It's, it, it's, it has zero predictive power of how close you are to the boundary. And that's, that makes this, uh, but for, for our predictive, uh, uh, for our trained predictor, no matter where you are, you have very good predictive, uh, perform, uh, predictive performance. Right? It, it will tell you how close you are to the boundary. Uh, so that's why you see the Jacobian testing is, is, is extremely worse than we have. And plus, it's, it actually takes much, much longer time, even if it's much, much faster than CPF, it is still like two order magnitude uh, slower than, than just run the four parts of a neural net. Okay. So uh, also, we identified uh, the, short, the shortfall of the, uh, yeah, of the copy method. But also, interestingly, it seems like if it's already very, very close to the boundary, it actually works. So that's actually one thing that we observe, the Jacobian um, small singular value actually is a good, good predictor. So let's zoom in. So if you zoom, so remember here from zero to five is megawatt. Here is from zero to 0 0.5, where supposedly Jacobian works a lot better, right? So if you look at this, the Jacobian start to look, look good, right? When you're close to the boundary, and it is indeed um, much more better. So in this case, our method still works pretty well, and Jacobian also works reasonably well. I would say pretty well, I agree. Uh, yeah, so the wish is smaller single value of the Jacobian predicted accuracy improves as our boundary move toward the boundary. And it, I think it's kind of a phase transition. It's beyond certain point, it's just telling nonsense. And below certain points, they tell you something very useful. 
uh, but still transfer learning is still a performance that's more similar in value and transfer learning doesn't have any issue of this it will give you good friction everywhere right okay so further uh, not only uh, we are able to uh, do situation awareness which is tell you what is the the margin you have for disturbance for uh, for voltage stability for current operating point but also because it's a neural net predictor, you can actually embed it easily in an operational problem, like the, uh, the optimal power flow. So this is optimal power flow. If you want to have stability margin guarantee, you can just add a constraint here and, and solve it, right? You can say, okay, I want certain, certain amount of distance to instability. Let's include this constraint, which is trained from the uh, procedure that we talked about and we grab that neural net predictor, we plug it in here, guess what? It is differentiable because it's neural net, right? So you can just still run your, your user optimization problem and it will get, give you an uh, 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 a, a, a operating point that is optimal with a safety margin, right? So uh, it, it's actually already mentioned. So this, this uh, desirability is already mentioned in very early work. And that, and that is when the, uh, I believe the first work that talked about using the smallest uh, eigenvalue as an indicator. And they, even back then, they tried to see how that can be used in operation, right? in what they call optimal toastering. Right? Uh, but but it's, it's, a, it's much less straightforward as we have it here because uh, the smallest value of the copian is not a closed form function where you can take different the derivative, right? to take the gradient. But for, for a neural net, you can do it. And you can just plug it in, operation problem, and that's it, right? Furthermore, uh, you can do very, because it's a predictor, it's millisecond, you can, very, you can do very fast reading of contingencies with uh, stability margin requirements. Uh, finally, so these are the two applications I, I, I uh, just uh, dive into the details, but there are many other applications as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, especially in the recent years, and, and that, that they are very interesting. For example, AC state estimation, and there's a work I just want to mention here, and they do nonlinear state estimation, which is an NPR problem, and uh, they actually uh, do something called unrolling. So unrolling is uh, have also been used in, in uh, NLP uh, speech, I believe. Uh, but also, uh, particularly in this case, because we typically use Gauss et al. to uh, solve, uh, no, sorry, the, yeah, Gauss Newton to solve the state estimation problem. Um, and that's an iterative method. And, and you can actually uh, roll, roll out that iterative algorithm and use the intermediate set to, to to cast intermediate steps as a neural net. And instead of using computing the, the um, Jacobian or the Hessian, you train it as the weights of the neural net. Uh, and that actually makes it more general than just use cost Newton. And that's uh, the key idea of the unrolling of this data estimation. And uh, again, for that dynamic assessment, I want you again point you to the previous tutorial by uh, the brilliant speakers Germans and Grammar, a very interesting work as well. And, and also recently there are learning based OPF. A lot of people try to do that, and that's understandably a very difficult problem. Uh, and some uh, the people who try to predict active uh, constraints of the OPF solutions, um, and several other things as well. Um, and also uh, ourselves are working on learning based on security check. And this is a, a very, very challenging combinatorial search problem, as you can see, right? So typically we can, in the current practice, we probably can do n minus one, not even n minus two uh, for large systems, uh, but can we do learning based and minus security check much beyond n minus one and n minus two? All right, so uh, for summary of the talk, of the talk and the tutorial, we uh, describe this general framework on learning to inform method to address especially uh, fundamentally hard problems. That's, that's as, 
I would say where this method is most uh, impactful in process monitoring by exploiting the information in the figure model via, via a data-driven approach. So it's a rather general framework. And you'll see there are so many instantiations in different particular applications where you have uh, specific designs, specific ingenuities that, that, re that is required to make it actually work. And uh, we present two case studies in detail, multi-line auto-identification and multi-speeding margin estimation to demonstrate the power of this methodology. And there are many more applications where each will have its own specific challenge and requires novel learning algorithm design. So with that, I will uh, conclude this uh, tutorial and uh, thank you very much. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, for Professor Zhao, for the wonderful talk. And there are many questions asked here. So i start with the, this one first. It's more like a comment. Maybe you can get back to it. So although smallest eigenvalue of the Jacobian may represent the voltage stability margin with no Q limit, this is hardly used in industry due to limit induced bifurcation. CPF is the most common approach. So do you have any response to this yes. comment? Sure, yes. Uh, I think CPS is, uh, is, is, is a good point. So I would say that, uh, right, so you will need to, so first of all, I'll point out, you know, with offline training, you can get very good performance with very fast uh, testing time. If you want to do CPS, CPF, uh, it's kind of, you, you do need to spend time, right? So first of all, uh, you need to, well, there actually, it depends on how, how accurately you want to uh, compute this margin, right? So if you, if you have certain direction in mind, uh, for example, if you want to increase all your load, at the same rate, right, with the same alpha uh, until it becomes unstable, then uh, yes, then then uh, if you just care about that one direction, uh, then, then yeah, you can do CPF to do the analysis, um, which will take some time, but it's, 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 it's definitely uh, a reasonable amount of time that you can handle in real time, right? But if you want to understand the worst case direction, you need to do iterative. CPF, which take longer. And also, supposedly, you need to search more directions. Even as the initial direction, you need to search more directions. So that takes even longer. Right? So it depends on how much time uh, you want to spend on these uh, computations. And especially if you want to do um, real-time security assessment, uh, then you don't have a lot of time to compute many, many scenarios or contingencies. Then that's, I guess, where the speed up, the acceleration will provide you the most uh, benefit because you really can do it very, very fast. Right? So just a few milliseconds. Um, and uh, another point is that this is just, so, so these two uh, classic, which, which are very useful, uh, they are specifically for Application, right? For that particular uh, definition of uh, instability. Um, and there may be more different uh, definition of instability, right? Um, maybe with a different definition, the stability can look like this, a smaller one, right? or, or whatever shape, where uh, the second method, the, the it's, it's, it's brilliant for bifurcation, but it will not be accurate for other kinds of definition of stability. Uh, but, but still, no matter what kind of uh, definition you have, the, our data-driven method still works because all you need to do is to generate points according to your specific definition of stability. And, and you can still generate points that is inside and outside, and then you generate a small amount of points that you try to compute the stability margin, right? and then you can do the transfer learning. So that is, uh, it's, 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 
that doesn't the methodology doesn't depend on the definition of the stability. So that's another advantage. But I do, be, I do appreciate the comment because that is a very good comment, and uh, it's, it's indeed what is uh, being used. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, the next question, uh, very interesting work on slide 22. Topology detection should depend on initiating operating conditions such as load generation, control, and networks. Once trained for 200K testing scenarios for one initiating, initiating conditions, how do we extend for other possible initiating conditions for real-time applications? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, right, so actually it's a very good point. And we, this is actually the point we are addressing. So this is uh, to clarify, we do not just train for one initiating condition. So, so that's why I want to highlight this part. If we train it for, for expecting that the real time initiating condition is completely different from what we have seen in training. So train, even in the training set, it's a combination of highly variable initiation, initiation condition with highly variable audit pattern. So it's not just many, many audit patterns for one initial condition. And, and by doing that, we want to make sure that in testing, uh, we are indeed uh, can perform well, given whatever I've seen or very different initial condition from training and still be able to produce very accurate uh, testing result. So that's a clarification I want to make. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in, also in this slide, I have a question. Since uh, this is a big data tutorial, right? and the question is, uh, how much uh, data do you think is, uh, is sufficient for training? Yeah, so, so how do so, you define that? Right, so, so this is, uh, so with more data, obviously you can keep imp improving your, your performance, but this is exactly this plot, right? So on the, on the right hand, on the horizontal, it's the training data size. We try many. We also try different number of neurons of the neural net. Uh, and uh, we see the performance, so this testing performance. And uh, as I said, if you, so it's actually depending on your performance requirement. If you think this is good enough, like this is good enough, then you only need, I believe it's 2K. No, how many? 20K. Here is like 20K. This is, with 20K, you already can, can get this uh, 0.992 performance. But if you want to, are willing to spend more offline time, then you can go to this point. You basically generate more data and then train for longer time. Okay, good, yeah. thank you. The next question is that I was wondering if there are any literature on the first case study, which is the multi-line outage estimation, not for a st static system, but for a dynamic system. For dynamic system? Uh, there... Uh, if there are any literature. I think so, I th I, I, yeah, there is, I forgot the, name but uh I, i'm very sure that i have seen seen something before yeah uh, but i can supply the references later but it's not i cannot remember the name right now yeah but this one you know, okay. uh, yeah the tutorial is for study said as i said but of course it can be also um studied for dynamic yeah. mm -hmm. okay sure and uh, yeah if you can also send me email if you find any literature related. Next question, voltage stability margin analysis and OPF are, are also sensitive to starting operating conditions. Once trained, how it can be used in the control center as initial conditions which are keeping on changing? Uh, let me try to understand the question. Um, yeah, so I can repeat the question for you. 
Yeah. Um, if you need. It, it depends on initial condition. I think solving the OPF, uh, it depends on initial condition. Yes. Uh, but it, 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 in itself, it's a problem, right? Even without voltage stability, let's say margin guarantee, it itself is a problem, the initial condition. Um, yeah. With the with a safe margin guarantee, safe operating margin guarantee, it's uh, same issue persists. I suppose uh, because of the non-convexity, this is non-convex, so I would say probably make it more complicated. But uh, we haven't looked into this problem, but uh, I, I think it's a very interesting problem. Yeah. But at least uh, the ability to write it as optimization problem, just just this ability we don't really have it before right so because uh, the margin itself is a very uh it's not a something that can easily put a hand on it but with a train predictor it's actually a function that you can plug it in a constraint right so i think that's that's a, a significant step um beyond what we can do before yeah great so the next question uh, can you please elaborate more on the all directions for margin estimation in one of your slides where you talk about the data generation. Okay. All yeah. directions. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, so I can I can draw, for example, uh, so three hundred bus we have, I believe, uh, six hundred to seven hundred dimensions. But let's just suppose we have two dimensions, right? Then we have this. Uh, uh, plot like this, and uh, for every, so suppose operating point. So, yeah, so here is an operating point that I'm interested in, and uh, I want to know um, the 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 uh, where is the where where, where is the worst case uh, direction that that, the, uh, that that represents the margin to the distance, right? So I'm going to search along this direction along this direction and then along this direction and along this direction. So every coordinate have two directions. Yeah. And every every direction, so suppose for this direction, for example, let's say this is the, it's the margin, right? And you can see that the true direction is kind of like this. This is the true direction. But when I search over this direction, I'm going to use the iterative method. to use this method and do something like this okay All right so then i'm going to have yeah some supporting hybrid plane to a projection supporting hybrid plane to a projection to converge to here so that that's how i try to ensure that i don't miss any direction right. so it's still a huge amount of computation it's a huge amount of computation to verify that i really get the direction right, right. yeah good sounds good thanks for clarification on dependency on initial condition for line voltage de detection for large systems like 23000 bus vac mm -hmm. system there are millions of initiating conditions and millions of possible topology conditions to for training will require trillions of cases to be trained with minimal differences for two different cases. How to scale? Yeah, uh, very good point. I would say that uh, I think the same question applies to all the machine learning based approaches. Um, because I would say that's always the, the, when we want to make it practical, that's, that's the biggest uh, hurdle for every machine learning approach. Um, for us, we, we observe that the data size uh, increases linearly. That's what we observe. We didn't really try many, many um, 23,000 buses because we also are bounded by computation resources. Um, so it's a very good question. So I think if we have some computers, we will try that. Um, but, but we do, so one thing I want to mention is that if you if you compare even for the CRM bus, how many we, we we are really really 
so, so far away from exhaustively enlisting all the cases, right? There is no way to do that, for, of course. Um, and yet we achieve very good generalizability. So it has to be that there are some low dimensional, a much, much lower dimensional uh, structure that is being captured. Uh, so that we don't need to exhaustively search, you know, in this case, this many of uh, topologies. This is not even the all of them. This is just, if you just look at all the cardinality below 12, this is the bottom to 21 topology. If you, if you want to consider all topologies, then it's just, it's, it's, it's astronomical. It's still not even this, but uh, it's, it, it seems like a, a much, much smaller fraction of training data is, is sufficient. And so this gives us hope. So I think to be practical in, in the real world, one other thing is that there are a lot of information that we, we could utilize to limit our scenarios of interest. I think we have to use it. Right? So it's not like we generate all the possible cases uh, you know, in, in, in all situations, but let's try to have a better idea of uh, what are the, the situations that we're most interested in. Maybe you can do a low forecast, right? So for, for that, you don't really explore uh, initial conditions that are very far from your low forecast, right? So that will make it much easier. And also you can do transfer learning as well, right? So you can train a crude model offline. And then uh, whenever you have uh, more real-time information, Let's, let's take into intermediate features and do transfer learning to fine tune on, on the more uh, specific cases that you're interested in. And uh, there are all kinds of, uh, uh, I would say, tools to use, uh, tricks to, to play with, uh, to address this situation. And, uh, and I think most importantly, it depends on the actual practical situation. And I think that's always when we can see, you know, what kind of uh, specific tricks we can use. Tricks we can use to make it uh, for the particular practical problem that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great. One, one audience ask, is the code for the method presented available online? The code, uh, it is online. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. And if it's not, I'll make sure it is online. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So. Can you, uh, last question, this is the last one. Can you please explain the difficulties that you faced during the neural network training and the measures that you have taken to solve them? For example, regularization, hyperparameter tuning, et cetera. Yeah. And of course there are so many issues that, that uh, when you train a neural net, uh, exactly like you said, hyperparameter tuning, regularization, they're all very, very key. Uh, there is, let me try to think, is there some, some prominent issue? Um, I, I think um, addressing overfitting, it's hard to say. Yeah, or any gradient uh, violation, any problem on that? No, uh, I, don't, I don't see that though. No. Um, mm. It's a regularization, okay. but, but there are all kinds of regularizations that you can do, right? It's, uh, mm -hmm. mm, we try dropout, but dropout yeah. doesn't really help. Uh, but the, yeah. changing the structure, changing the size, and uh, always looking at a validation error, Try to get a sense of uh, what mm. works. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think generating data is kind of interesting. So, uh, for these cases, mm. for example, that the, we we do this data augmentation, and this turns out to be very useful because otherwise you only have one data point, but now you, on, on this entire line you can freely generate the data, and that will help you a lot. Mm. So that's one one trick. Um, yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of other tricks, but uh, it's hard for me to point out one that is standing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. I think, uh, yeah, it's the uh, time to call an end. It has been one and a half hour.
I think it, your talk has attracted so many questions and interest. So thank you so much for your talk, Professor Zhao. And please uh, uh, send us the slides if possible, since we will upload them to our uh, PIS Big Data subcommittee website for other uh, audience review. So thank you. Right, I will do that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.